information to back that up. I don't have any research to back it <laughs> up. But whenever I've been in the studio and the, the modelers, and I like, to, I like to, to push their buttons, and I say, animating is the most fun you can have in Maya. And then they'll say, ah, yeah, that's not right. You, you don't know what you're talking about. And then I'll say, what do you know, modeler? You, you, modelers, you're just a bunch of drunks. And then you're they really get up. lit up. You're just making that up as you go, aren't you? <laughs> hey, Leon. Hey, Mark. How are you, man? Good. A little bit tired, but good. Yeah, yeah. I've I've drank like about nine cups of this, which is coffee, not bugs. Nine cups <laughs> of bugs. Yeah, I've only started for my first cup. Oh my god, you got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah, just I'm barely woke boil. up, so yeah. I'm gonna boil the jug. Cause it's like seven a.m. there or something, isn't it, Leon? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? I feel, I got to tell you this. I feel oh. terrible. I have a, a new student and she meets me at 4 a.m. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I missed her. I totally flaked oh. on her on, on Tuesday. Oh. And I said, I'm so sorry. I'll meet with you whenever you like. And she said, well, just how about Thursday? And I said, okay, Thursday, but that's my Wednesday. And so I wrote her down for Thursday. So then again, I missed her again today. So twice she's gotten up at 4 a.m. to meet with me and I missed her both times. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my god i feel like i need to fly to where she is and just like sit with where her. where is she i think she's in uh i think she's in your neck of the woods oh okay i think i think i'm gonna get a flaming bag of poop on my front doorstep if i <laughs> if i don't sort my my life out i thought you were gonna say a flaming onion but we don't actually have those oh blooming onion Bloomin' Onion, that's it. Yeah, that's Jay told want. me about those at the Australian Steakhouse or something. Yeah, no, the Outback Steakhouse. Outback. Why are you asking me? It's your, you guys are the Bloomin' well, Onion. We don't have those. That's, don't yes, do you those. Do. yes, you do. It's an American thing. We don't, oh, you got we don't deep fry onions in batter or whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> you guys, you guys, uh, you guys have, you, we think that you guys have uh, blooming onions, and you guys think that we elected Donald Trump, so we're even. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you guys did. <laughs> we would never, just like you would never eat an onion soaked in batter and deep fried, we would never elect a... Uh, I would eat it, but I'd never cook it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I would try to cook it. I'd probably light my kitchen on fire. I can't believe people <laughs> deep fry turkeys. Like, how is that even possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, how much oil would you need for that? That is crazy. It's crazy. My brother-in-law did it one year. Uh, I wasn't around for that. Um, but uh, he said it's the best turkey he's ever eaten. <laughs> so who knows? Um, I'm just giving it a minute to see if we have any stragglers. Um, it seems a bit odd that there's just the two of you. It is odd. I'm hoping it's not Brittany something I should said. Be here. Yeah. Well, let's get started. We, I mean, we got two hours, right? Yeah. I haven't got an, I, I feel like I haven't done enough because I've been spending all this time on modeling. Yeah. I just want to sort of animate. <laughs> oh yeah. You're modeling. You guys are taking both these classes. Yeah. Uh, so currently. And, aren't you? Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of not into the modeling anymore. Aww. Like I feel like I, I know enough to, to, to do what I need to do. <laughs> right. Like maths. I got to a certain point in maths in high school and I was uh -huh. like, yeah, I don't need to know anymore. <laughs> right. I'm not going to build bridges. Yeah. I'm not going to actually be a mathematician. Right. And actually make it like solve equations half a, half a kilometer long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, well, let's look at your poses. All right. Oh, you got a bunch of them. Yeah. The last few aren't posed. They're just. Oh, yeah. yeah. T-pose. They, they were just spares. <laughs> gotcha. That I didn't get to yet. All right. So, um, you went through all the, obviously, the, the subsequent lecture material and things like yeah. that. Good. Okay. So as you know, the thing we're looking for with a pose is a good silhouette and something that reads and something that's, that's uh, easy to read and, and, um, and uh, communicates our idea. 
to our audience. So this looks, this looks pretty good. It's not, it's nice and extreme. There's a couple of things I would look at. Yep. One of the things is, let me just see here. So for, for a pose like this, Sarah, Yep. I'm going to zero. I'm just wondering why this I'm trying to figure out how things are moving here. I'm going to zero out the rotations in the COG. Oh, it's almost nothing. And then I'm wondering, oh, I see. There's a secondary one down here. Yeah, That's... it's like a pelvic tilt or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. And uh, I, I apologize. This, sh this should have been explained in the, in the videos. But this thing has two controllers that kind of do the same thing. And I don't know why. We have the pelvis and then we have uh, uh, the pelvis ox. Well, it pretty much does the same as the pelvis. So what ends up happening is that now you have, you have a rotation, for example, our rotation Y, which is our, our left and right rotation. You have, a, a, you have a rotation Y with this pelvis and then a rotation Y with this pelvis. But you see the rotation okay. Y here is a negative? Yep. And the rotation here is in positive? Yep. So now you have these, they're, they're moving in different directions. So yep. now you have twice as much work because you have to clean up all that stuff, right? You ha now yep. you have two rotation or I just channels. Or zero one out and animate the other one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. That's a, that's a long way around that explanation. So I'll zero both of them out and then this is the one that I'll, that I'll use. Not the, not the ox one. Uh -uh. <laughs> nah. We hate that ox one. It's terrible. And this thing's okay, but you can see like if you take it too far, it kind of squares things out and gives you this yeah. like, sort yeah. of pinch there. So I kind of use it within reason. I mean, within reason. Moderation? Um, because it's all, it's all within reason, but I, I try not to take it too far. And uh, because it just flattens things out. And then I'll use pull this one down to get a bit more of a curve through there. You see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, you might. <laughs> I'll try not to do the Aussie. Oh, no. Mine's always a Kiwi accent. <laughs> then here, the clavicle, that looks good. You've, you've, you've pulled that back, and that's nice. We get these weird twists with this arm sometimes, depending on... on mm. On where you place it and get a little twisty but that's okay and then this wrist I'd probably just you know just uh, just pull that up a little bit give it a little bit more break up right there anything move on your screen I don't think oh really is anything moving yet no nope. all right let's try that again it was moving on my screen oh huh. How about now? Oh. <laughs> you were looking at your screen? I'm looking at my eye uh, on my screen. <laughs> oh, Sarah. I need another coffee. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure distance learning is, is right for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I had my laptop in front of my PC the other day, and I was trying to get <laughs> <laughs> type things onto my PC. <laughs> yeah, you I had a board on my Mac. <laughs> I had a, a a friend of mine that I was working with at a studio one time. She came over to me and she said, "Can you help me? There's something wrong with my computer." And so I went over to her computer, and she's like, "I can't click on anything. Nothing's working." And I looked right down here in my, and you know, this little window down here in the bottom left. Yeah. It was just doing this. And it just was looking like, no, it was, yeah, it was doing that. It just looked like that. And I'm like, that's weird. And you couldn't really fix it. It just kept doing that. And then I looked down and uh, she had, she was eating food and she had her, she had a plate and her plate was resting on her space bar. <laughs> <laughs> she was very embarrassed. And of course I told everybody, I still am telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> look at you you dummy and she's like please don't tell anyone i'm like i'll never tell anyone 
<laughs> my dad used to fix appliances and he had to fix a he went to this old lady's house once to fix a vacuum cleaner because it wasn't sucking and um yeah it was like just completely chock-a-block and he said when was the last time you cleaned it out and she's like oh i didn't know you had to clean it out ah there you go she had two years of so dirt i guess she just assumed that just magically disappeared <laughs> now there's a there's a million dollar idea um, I'm going to want to bring this elbow down a little bit because it always, I always feel like, uh, if our elbows are up, it always feels a little bit awkward. Like we're like, you know what I mean? Like we're kind of trying to get out of the way of something or so. And the other thing too, with, if you're ever doing motion capture, whenever you do motion capture solves, they call them, the elbows always stick out. So I was going to bring the elbows in. So you kind of get, you get an eye for it after a while. Okay. So I just want to drag that shoulder down so that the elbow is down this way. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da! Now, what is rotating our head there? Now, something else has got, done something weird. It's got our noggin. Yeah. What have you done? This is there an auxiliary head control as well? Oh, what's this? Yes, there is. Ah, oh, there is. For Pete's sake. What? Why do they do that? Why do why why why? On this this one, you can actually select the head control. It looks like, and you can hide this thing. Ah, uh, the auxiliary thing. The auxiliary thing. There we go. Ta-da! Just things to watch for uh, when you have a new rig. There was a there's a I don't know if you guys have ever seen a Malcolm rig. Have you ever seen a Malcolm rig? It sort of floats around the internet. It's from uh, it's from another school. I forget what school it is, but it has so many controllers, but they all do the same thing. So they're like for the chest controller, they'll have three of them. And you, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to download the picker and you're supposed to hide the ones you don't want to use. But people never do it. And I've had students use the Malcolm Ring before, and they'll have like the chest on. You know, all three of them will be animating, so that the, the the whole character is bubbling because they'll have like the chest moving this way and this way and this way. And it's just a god awful mess. So what so are I, those extra controllers really, what's the purpose of having two controllers that do pretty much the same thing? It, it, it I don't really know that rig well enough to know. Yeah. What um, about this one then? Why would there be two? Why would there be an auxiliary? Yeah. Yeah. What's... I don't know. I don't know. I would never use it. It's just okay. more, I can get everything I need out of this thing without it. So I've tried the auxiliary to see if it does anything that I need, but I've, I've never, I've never found it to be super valuable in any way. I don't know. To me, it just, it just is more, it just doubles this thing. It doesn't even seem to really, maybe it does have a little bit of a different, no, it has the exact same uh waiting is the other one so yeah i don't know i just go in here grab it or select it create a layer and hide it be done with it um yeah no i don't i don't know i'd have to talk to uh i think it's delaney who who rigged this thing so I'd, we'd have to talk to delaney and ask delaney why you put that in there and here's the thing i didn't so, know she rigged things sorry i didn't know delaney rigged things Delaney, that was the modeler. No, the oh. rigger. Isn't De Delaney not the rigger? It was Delaney who was mo teaching modeling oh. when I was there. Sorry, it's not Delaney, it's Delano. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. Right. They're so similar. <laughs> now, uh, with this guy here, I want to push these, rotate these feet out a little bit. You know, this old yep. song and dance. Rotate this foot out a little bit. Just just so if they're ever pointing to straight, it just it just looks too CG. Um, now this is a good candidate, uh, Sarah, for an IK hand. Yep. You know the difference between IK and FK? I know the difference in the fact that you rotate, you know, you sort of rotate one, the other one you just kind of move. But I don't yeah 
there's forward kin, kin, kinetics and, and something that starts in, with inverse. I. Leon, are you? For, let, let, let me just give you sort of a, yeah. uh, a layman's because I don't know um, all the technical stuff behind. It. Leon, are you familiar with IK and FK? Just a little bit. Perfect. That gives us something to talk about. So FK arms or FK anything. Anything can be FK. FK stands for forward kinematics. I'm not going to write it all out because it's I'm writing with a mouse and it's not great. And forward kinematics essentially means that the motion of a chain, this is a chain, all this the all these stuff, all these things are bone chains, you know. It means that forward kinematics means that the motion starts at the root and goes forward down the root. So for example, this arm, if we rotate the shoulder, it rotates everything forward of the shoulder, nothing behind. And then if we select the elbow, again, it rotates everything forward of the elbow, nothing behind. Of course, the wrist, same thing, so on and so forth. The um, uh, chest is a combination of both really, because we can rotate back and forth here, but we can also translate. Now you can see we can't translate our FK on the shoulder. We can't translate any of this stuff. It's rotation only. And typically FK, forward kinematics, means rotation only. Now where that's valuable, obviously, is if your character's running or jumping or whatever, that's really valuable because setting up your character um, as like a bone chain makes it easy for us to uh, not only we compose it quickly, but then our overlap is much easier and we feel like we have more control over it. Where it doesn't do us much good is if, say, this character, we wanted this character to um, lean against a wall. And we'll just say, for sake of argument, oh, crap. Could not save file. Damn you, grease pencil. I was on such a roll, too. Does it make it crash a lot? Grease pencil does, yeah. Just in, um, like, on the new Mac, or is it on all of? Uh, twenty eighteen, twenty seventeen. Yeah. Um, Maya twenty seventeen didn't crash it, but Maya. Yeah, but have you looked into two thousand nineteen yet? I haven't. Their, their biggest, the only real major change I see is they've got cached playback. Yeah, yeah, to speed things up. Yeah, apparently. But I've had issues um, because when, <coughs> I, when I've used, when I was using this rig um, on my PC, I didn't have the cached playback on, but I think I animated it on my, my Mac with it on. Mm -hmm. So then, like, we, it was glitching out, like, the torso was disappearing. Mm -hmm. It was kind of strange. But then, mm -hmm. as soon as I put it onto the cached playback, yeah. Too bad. Well, what's happening there? It's probably the same. It's just a, it's a visual thing. Like you're, yeah, it's, um, it's a graphics card issue. Okay. So FK. So if I got this FK hand here and I want to lean our buster character here up against the wall, you can see he's just going to go right through the wall. So FK doesn't work very well for things that need to, um, stick in space. The, the feet, on the other hand, the feet are IK, inverse kinematics. All that means is that it's the inverse of the FK. So it starts at the end of the bone chain and works backwards. So if we grab this foot, we can rotate the foot, but you see it doesn't affect anything behind it. But if we translate it, we can translate it all, you know, all over the place. So, <laughs> excuse me, when we Grab the COG, we push it down, the feet don't crash through the floor. If these feet were FK, and if I select our main global controller, you can see in here I have FK, IK switches. If we switch those to zero, you see the feet go through the floor. Now, FK feet are valuable if our character was, say, swinging on, you know, uh, 
swinging through the air on like uh, uh what do you call those things uh monkey bars, bars. Uh, monkey bars yes thank you they can be really really valuable for that because if you're if if you're in um ik and you're swinging your character through space the feet stick back here so that's in a nutshell that's the difference as far as as far as we're concerned at this point between ik and fk hands now your feet are almost always an IK. Um, the hands, on the other hand, <laughs> um, well, they can switch back and forth. And you can switch them throughout your animation as well. What I've, Doesn't that mess with stuff if you're switching it through animating? It can get a little tricky. Yeah. But, but there's ways around it that can, clean, that, that can make it a little bit faster. But what I do is... For me personally, if, if, if ever my character in any shot that I'm working on, if ever they're going to need to like rest their hand on a table or on their head or anything like that, I just animate the whole thing in, in IK and I don't worry about switching. So for example, if we go here where I was saying, when I said this is a good candidate for IK, well, I want to, put, I want to have this hand in IK because I want to be able to adjust this pose if I ever want to do any adjustments. And say I want to lean this character forward, well, their hand goes through their leg. Well let's switch that to IK. So let's say I want to switch this to an IK hand, but if I select my global again, and I go in here to my left arm and switch it from zero to one, which, which switches it from an FK to IK, it snaps it back to its um, starting, we'll say, global position. And then I have to drag it back and somehow figure out um, where that was. And if I'm animated for one, for a single pose, that's not a big deal. But if I'm animating through a, um, a scene, I'll never line that thing up perfectly to where it was. So here's what we do. I'm going to go in here and say, and you, you guys don't have to retain any of this information. It won't really matter. We'll, we'll, we will revisit it as we go, but I'm just giving you sort of a, a rough overview for now. I'm going to say create um, locator. Ta-da! <laughs> There's my locator. You can't see it. I'll have to go show locators. You don't really need to see it, but we'll, I'm going to make it a little bit larger. There it is. Now I'm going to, let's open up my outliner here. I'm just going to mute myself for a second while I make a coffee. Sure. So now I'm going to select um, the wrist and I'm going to control select the locator here in the, you could select it here as well. Then I'm going to say, uh, um, I'm gonna go up here and select. Um, oh, I gotta be an animation, of course. Constrain, parent constrain, I'm gonna turn off, maintain offset. Again, if this, is, if this is sort of beyond you guys, it's not that big a deal, we'll revisit it. I snap that locator there. I just want that locator to, to be positioned where that, uh, where the wrist is. So my locator is stuck in space where my wrist is. So now when I go in here and say left arm and I'm going to make it um, uh, inverse kinematics or an IK hand, now I can simply select the locator as the parent. The hand is the child. The child will go wherever the parent goes. I'll go back to constrain. I'm just going to snap this to where the locator is. Ta-da! So now it's in the exact same spot that it was. Now I'd, I'll delete the locator. And that's just a quick way if you're ever switching between IK and FK hands. It's a quick way to do it. Anyway, much quicker when you've done it like a thousand times like I have. Now with this pose, once again, I'm going to flare these feet out a little bit. Take the knees out slightly. We don't want those, those feet to be straight like that. I'm going to push this foot back a little bit. I just feel like he's a little bit too far back there. I want to get a bit more weight behind him. And then I'm also going to lift this heel up a bit because this bend here is a little too sharp for me. So I'm going to just pull that heel up slightly. Not too much. That should do it. Next, I'm going to... You see, when I, as soon as I switch to IK, the, the elbow came in. That's why I wanted to switch it to IK is because the elbow was out a little bit with the FK, but I want that elbow to come in. The reason why I want it to come in is whenever we're doing people that are sad or depressed or anything like that, what we tend to do when we're depressed is we get super, um, uh, we're vulnerable, right? We're sad. Our emotions like 
we can be, you know, when you, whenever you're, you're at your lowest emotional state, um, it's a dangerous place to be long term. You're vulnerable. If you're happy and you're confident, and you're going out to the world, you're not as vulnerable. But when you're sad, you're vulnerable. So yeah, to, to all sorts of things. So you oh, tend yeah. to, yeah, you close up. You bring your elbows in, like everything gets really, really closed in. So this helps us. If if we still had our our FK hand here, it's more difficult to rotate that elbow in because we have to actually rotate it in from here and bring it in that way, which means a lot more work to try to pose it back onto the leg. But being in an IK hand, that hand is just going to stick where it's just going to stay where it's going to stay. So this way I can now bring my character. I can move my character around a little bit and that hand is just going to stay where it's going to stay. It's just going to stick in the space and then I can, I can do a little slight adjustment without getting too deep into, into making a mess. Something like that. Looks good. This, this hand as well, I would also make an IK hand mm -hmm. only for that same reason. And then I could even like uh, constrain that hand to the head. So when the head moves, the hand would follow, but we won't get too deep into that for now. It was a bit, <laughs> yeah, I was actually wanting to swap it. But I didn't know how. Which is where's where do you switch from IK to FK? Right here on the global. Okay. IK <laughs> FK A O K. <laughs> See, everybody's missing all this great comedy. I know. What are they doing? Brittany said know. she had to. She got called into work. <gasps> how dare they? I know. <laughs> Same here, Sarah. You'd want you'd want IK hands here because then you can put, um, you know, you can yeah. push him down and the hands will just stick at that spot yeah. right there. So that's I would switch that again. I would make sure to flare these feet out a little bit so they're not just completely straight in your rotation Y. Make sure you're always exploring. I like to always think that I'm always exploring all of my channels just to make sure I haven't left anything behind. And for me, when, when I see a, an animator's work and, the, and I see that the feet are just pointing straight down the, the, the rotation channel, I, I always see it from a mile away. And I think to myself that that animator didn't explore that, those channels and the feet and really explore how those feet go. So make sure you, you, you take a look, look at that because other animators and recruiters are looking at the same stuff. I'm going to pull this up a bit to give a little more bend here. Let's just see how that line is very straight right there. So I want to just pull that up a little bit. Good. And then. I just finished a marathon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll roll that foot up just, just because that angle there just looks a little too, too sharp. So we'll just bring yeah. that up a little bit there. And then we could even push this pose further by. Going back and really rotating that thing up, and getting that foot back there. Yeah, it looks good. Nice. Jumping for joy. All yeah. right. That looks good to me. Yeah, nice stretch, compression, stretch, compression. Yeah, man, looks good. I like this. Might bring that back a little further just to open that up a little bit right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well done. Leon, if you have any questions as I'm going through this as well, you know, just, just, uh, just rattle my cage. Yeah, no problem. I'm just observing. Sure. <laughs> That's cool too. That one's a, come on. Come on. What are you doing? <laughs> now what's this little ridge here? I've never seen that before. And that's something. I think I noticed it either. I wonder if it's just from this thing being pulled out so far. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's that there. Okay. So I want to bring that in a little bit and then rotate this guy here back a little bit and then rotate this one 
which is our COG, forward a little bit. Because I want to, here's my way of thinking, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I want this, I want this arc in the back here. I want that to be shared throughout the entire spine. So if I select your uh, chest controller, I see that there isn't any animation on it at all. Or sorry, any, there's not, you haven't moved it, I should say. There's no information on the channels. So I'm going to bring that back and then pull this one back. So that way we get more of a stretch through here, or sort of, uh, I guess, a more natural stretch throughout all these controllers. And why that's important is that when you start, as you're posing, if I'm getting, if I'm getting the shape of my chest through only one controller of the torso, when I go to try to animate that into another pose, it's going to feel kind of weird. And it's not going to trans transition very well. So I'm always trying to think of this whole shape here as as just as, as a as a piece of geometry that i'm just trying to move all together like it has a spine running down it and i can sort of take it and twist it around so i want to use all these things together does that make sense yes and then the the we have the hips come this way, which is good, which means that the chest is gone going this way, which is nice. So we got a little bit of a twist in there. And then we've rotated the hips down this way slightly here. So what I'm going to do with this one is go the other way in, in Z to get a bit of, of a stretch through here yep. and a compression there. Alternately, you could try it the other way. No. doesn't really matter. Yeah. It looks out of balance. It does, doesn't it? His leg or these arms are super long on this on this rig. <laughs> you can shorten them. Go down his knees, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're almost his knuckles drag on the ground. You can shorten the arms, I think, um, if you ever need to. I, I, I don't think I ever have, but come on, you. Uh, you broke your own rule. What did I do? You, you didn't click off the all those little. Oh, I did. I had it clicked off, oh, okay. and then I clicked it back on to select the. But yes, you're right. I have everything else on there. Look at that. All objects off. What a funky little. Anyway, um, all that stuff looks good. You you could get a little more variation yeah, just that hands a bit boring yeah just kind of flat so you could yeah. you could break that up a little bit but um yeah you can bust that up slightly and then the head as well i might not have it quite so and once again just break those feet up Excellent. All right, moving right along. Two thumbs way up. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. It does look like he needs a little bit more of a something in the torso, yeah. It looks a bit well it's a it's a it's a little more um it's a bit more of an intricate pose because you've gone with a with an s shape as opposed to a um a, 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 a c shape i guess is what i would say yeah. which is fine we can get a we can do that for sure i mean the 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 uh other way you could do it is to is to do that and that to stick with the to stick with the with the c shape but I quite like that. I think that looks pretty good. Now you've also translated this thing around, which is fine. Um, you just have to be careful because as you move the the pelvis off the center of gravity, mm -hmm. it'll start to become a little trickier to animate it when you're going between poses. But it's not a hard and fast rule that you're not supposed to do that. It's just something to be aware of. Does that make sense? Yep. Because now as you move your center of gravity, it's going to just live out there. And then at some point it's probably going to come back here. And so 
This is good. This is must must be what you feel like when you're listening to my tutorials. No. No, more like music from the this decade. <laughs> what about those uh uh um my favorite new band? Um Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> Your favorite new band. Don't you love them? I love them. <laughs> Are you trying to pick a fight? <laughs> no, they're just they're just crazy. They're they're twenty one year olds and they're just ripping it up. So it doesn't bother you that <laughs> they sound just like another band. Well, here's 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 what I'd say to that. Uh, um, I think it's ironic that they're stealing from from a band that's known for stealing. Yeah. So I yeah. think it kind of all works out. But uh, Robert Plant gave him his seal of approval. So yeah, he did. So. What are you going to do? Uh, yeah. Here's what I'd say. They're really, really, really good. And they're completely a carbon copy of Led Zeppelin. But that's not easy to do. <laughs> thousands upon thousands of bands have tried it. Not many, have, not many men can actually reach most of the notes that Robert Plant. Here's the thing. Not many, not many, <laughs> not many people can sing like that kid can sing. Yeah. for sure um and not many bands can write songs that sound exactly like led zeppelin songs <laughs> but aren't led zeppelin songs but are every bit as good you know what i mean like it's not it's not easy to do it's not an easy thing to write those songs and and present them that well <laughs> you know what i'm saying and yeah. the reason how i know it's not that good is because there's been thousands of bands who have tried it there's been thousands yeah. of bands who have tried to do exactly what these guys are doing and failed. I mean, pretty much every bar band you've ever seen <laughs> has tried to do exactly that. <laughs> and they couldn't do it. They couldn't yeah. actually do it. They write really good songs, these guys. Like, they're truly Led Zeppelin songs. They're lost Led Zeppelin songs, but they're good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway. That's the thing. I'm fascinated by them because I was never a big Led Zeppelin fan, as you know. But then you see this band come out and just completely shamelessly go like, look at us. We're Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to say that they were influenced by like Deep Purple and basically everyone other than Led Zeppelin. Yeah. They said Aerosmith and stuff <laughs> like, like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I pretty much stopped playing music because I couldn't write anything that sounded unique. I, I tried to write my own music and it always sounded like Super Tramp or Jimi Hendrix or I don't even think anything sounded too much like Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Reason. Other than the song I wrote that was in like, um, it was in a C open tuning. Yeah. So it sounded a little bit like one of the other songs that Led Zeppelin did in that open C tuning, but it, right. it sounded more like a super tramp song. Well, nobody really sounds unique is the thing. Well, Here's I wanted thing. to have some uniqueness, you know, like even though Led Zeppelin might be what some people call a cover band, they, yeah. their songs that they, they redid still has their own sound, still sounds like Led Zeppelin. Sure. Not necessarily sounds like Muddy Waters or whoever they ripped off. Yeah. And that's, that's only because yeah, I'm just doing some adjustments as we go here, but that's only because, um, and it's interesting to remember they, they were missing what they were trying to do. What they ended up sounding like wasn't what they wanted to sound like. And that's with most bands. That's not what they want to sound like, but they just keep going. You know, uh, yeah. I think Pete Townsend from the who once when he did Quadrophenia, somebody said it's such an amazing record. And he said, you should have heard what it sounded like in my head. It was inherently, <laughs> it's like when you animate something, it's inherently disappointing when you get finished. Cause you're like, ah, I had so many hopes and dreams for this piece <laughs> of animation that I, was, I was going to do. And it just ends up looking like every other piece of animation. It's like, well, yeah, cause there's really only one way you can animate. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah in so much as like, it's still about things that move. And then when you get every once in a while, I'll have animators that will come to me and say, young people that'll come to me and, and they'll show me their animation and it'll be terrible. And I will say, uh, uh, here's the things that you need to do to make it work. And they will say, yeah, but I, I don't want it to look like other people's animation. <laughs> and I'm like, and they'll, you know, say it's my style, you know, for it to look like shit. And I'm like, it's that, that certainly is style. Um, 
And I mean, and that's what punk rock was. It's like, well, we don't know how to play, so we'll just play super, super loud and be super, super obnoxious. Okay, sure, go for it, I guess. You know, but it's still like, I guess shit is, I don't know. Anyway, with this pose, <laughs> all I did really, I noticed that this thing was, was sort of tilted this way. So I just brought it this way a little bit so we'd get yeah. a bit more of a stretch through there, just looking at all those areas. And, and then I brought, the, I brought the clavicles forward a little bit. And then again, this thing, when this thing goes back too far, we get these little lumps in the back. So we could just bring that in a little bit and then get to get this curve working a little bit better. We can, oops. We can Would you that. have done this in IK? That, like the hands and these the hands? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. the reason why oh, I do them in IK okay. is <laughs> for this for this pose, it's it's okay. But if if I have a character who's going like uh like that, I don't want the hands to be going, you know, like this. Yeah. I want them to be able to stick to the head. So what I would probably do is is I would um, if you will allow me a minute here and I'll go and I'll say do the whole locator thing again. Do I still have a locator? I don't. So I'm going to create a locator once more. <coughs> I'm going to select the wrist. I'm going to uh, control select the locator. And I'm going to say constrain parent and snap that locator there. There we go. Now I will select that. Oops. I want to undo that parent because I don't want it to be stuck there. So now my locator is in the center of that controller there and then I'll grab my um, global. Oops, sorry. I'll grab my global and that's the left arm there and I'll turn on my, my IK which is down where we left it and then I will grab the locator. I will grab the Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. I'll grab my IK controller and I'll hit parent and I'll snap that hand up to where it was. Excellente. Okay. Now. The elbow has gone kooky, has it? The, oops. The yeah. elbow has gone kooky, but we can fix that. Yeah. We will grab this elbow it controller. Kind of makes it look a bit better. It's kind of a bit more... Uh, yeah, you can sort of place that elbow wherever you want. But here's a cool thing we can do now is we can select the head controller and we can shift select the IK controller and we can constrain it to the head. Uh, we'll just say parent constraint, maintain offset is on. And now wherever the head goes, that hand will follow. <laughs> And so we could do what we could do the same thing with this hand. So you can yeah. see if he's going like, oh, the hands will just be stuck there. Yeah. You can't you can't do that with with FK hands. Can you dig it? Yep. I'll awesome. It. We can dig it. And then we have our T poses. Yeah. So that were my spares that I haven't done yet. Cool. Awesome. Well, any questions about that, Sarah or Leon? Not really, no. Right. No, I'm good. Good. Well, Leon, let's crack I've open. Got one question. Yeah, go did for you, it. Did you do anything with the eagle wig? Oh, I didn't. I completely, <laughs> completely flaked. Oh, oh. I know. <laughs> I got, I got too distracted by my favorite new band. <laughs> <laughs> What's what is it? Uh, note to self. Animate Eagle Van Fleet. No. <laughs> for Sarah. Well, not just for me. Maybe other people will like it too. You should do Twitch soon and do like the, the Eagle Rig there or something. Yeah. Like um, I always think it would be the most entertaining to do a Twitch stream on something I know nothing about. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm going to go on Twitch and I'm going to animate, I don't know, or not even animate. I'm going to model, I'm going to model this eagle rig. <laughs> Can we do that? That would be so funny. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go on Twitch and I'm going to like, I'm going to paint a portrait. 
<laughs> while looking at myself. Um, that could be in interesting. Um, just see how that plays out. It's like, like a painting that Hobbit picture there. Sorry. When you were doing that, it looked like you were painting the Hobbit poster. Yeah, that's how I painted that poster, like this, <laughs> <laughs> just by looking at the reflection. That's how <laughs> that's how skilled I am. <laughs> Leon, you had. Uh, did we look at your drone last week, or we haven't yet? Uh, no. Is it amazing? Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> Well, I'm expecting big things from this drone, Leon. Big, big things. Did you have any trouble with it? Um, a little bit, yeah. Oh, yeah? Did you sort it out or did you, do, you, uh, do you have some questions? Whoa. Look at that thing go. Well, that looks fine. Yeah? It's just that, uh, um, well, there's a few things I had trouble with. Mm-hmm. The first one was just the, the um, like the timing, right? Uh huh. Um, because yeah, I don't know like where to put frames and how far to space them out, like to get the correct um, speed. Yeah. So I've just like extended the frames until it sort of looked right, and then like that very end when the drone like dropped, um, it just feels like it's not dropping fast enough. Mm. But I struggled to get to achieve that uh what else oh the blades like that's another thing i struggle with a bit is just getting this like the blade to spin the um correct um speed gotcha and yeah all right all right let's have a look everything looks right um Just drop this in here. There we go. If we have time today, after you look at Leon's and I think whoever else's work, would you be able to remind me how to constrain a camera to say the the drone or the car, so you can actually watch it from like going around the track or or whatever? Yeah. Because sure. I wanted to do that when I was doing my car, <laughs> but I couldn't remember, I couldn't work out how to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do that. Thanks. Simple. Easy peasy. So th this all looks right, Leon. I mean, the idea behind this again is just to give you a, an overview on like how to, you know, key things and what a rig is and all that kind of stuff. Uh, th your setup of your props looks fine. Here's the thing you can do for well, let's first look at, at when it lands and you said it didn't seem like it was going down fast enough. So one of the things you can do there, or you did it, you break this thing and you just, or you, you just make this thing sort of speed up as it falls. Once it hits, you can go like, uh, I'm just going to put that on a whole frame. There we go. Bear with me for a quick second. Okay, once it lands, we can go through and give it like a, a bump. Like so and like so and like. Too big of a bump, Mark, for God's sake. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> You're absolutely right about trying to find the timing for this stuff. Like it's it just takes it just takes a bit of practice to sort out your timing for things like this. Boom. There we go. Got a little bump there. And the other thing that you can do to make this thing sort of feel, I don't know, a bit more alive. Like, I think your timing all looks really good. But one thing you can do is, like, you can start adding rotations into it. So as it starts coming up, like, one side drags. It's like, then it gets to the top. Here we can sort of float them that way. And so it's just more channels again to, you know, 
to play with. You know what I mean? So if you get a little rotation there as well, you start to get this going on. Rather than just this and moving, you can start to get like, it can start to flow a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that, that was something I, um, I want to do, but I wasn't sure how to do it. Mm. And by looking at you, how you did it, it's actually easy. <laughs> yeah, you just, you, just start, you just go in and start to make it. Some of this stuff, like the style of this drone animation, or I should say the method on how we're animating this drone is called straight ahead animation. We're not really blocking it out. Just going in and like moving things around until it works. And if it doesn't work, we just delete it and try it again, you know? So your overall speed and how everything's moving looks really, really good. Now I would just, this, this would be like something I would just go in and add detail to. That's all. And then like as it, like from here, comes back like this. And then up here. And it's coming across to like here, and we can you know you just I just kind of get to a point where it's changing direction, and that's where i I'll change direction of my rotation, and I just have the rotation over here in the graphic, I just have the rotation selected. So now I can sort of move this stuff around. Goes up, curls down this way. Boom, boom. We can go kind of wiggle around a little bit so it can make a sort of a quick. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just kind of make it feel so wherever wherever your translations are are changing direction, that's where I'll sort of change the direction of the rotation as well. So he's going boom, and then as you're changing direction, going up or left or whatever, we can add a little curve into that and sort of make it feel like it's kind of a little more unstable. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah because I managed I managed to get like the. Um, swaying like back and forth right it's just like the rotation um i didn't incorporate yeah yeah and it, i mean the best thing the best thing i could say like i mean listen i've, I've clearly been working in maya for 20 years so i can kind of go in and sort of go like bang 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 and, and and on top of what you already have i can make the rotation work fairly quickly to a fairly good point but i wouldn't have been able to do that if if you're if the, your base translation animation wasn't good. We would have to have started there first. So for me to just layer on some detail of rotation, it, it's only because your, your, your initial base layer of translation animation was solid. So, and that's all that really matters. Okay. Yeah? So how do you de determine like how long um, like a certain uh, motion will take? Like it will take like 50 or 70 frames. Like how do you determine that? Yeah, that's a great question. So depends on what you're doing so the that's what that's what typically what we use reference for so let's say i'm going to animate a drone flying like this and and um you'll you'll this assignment aside you'll typically have um an idea of why that drone is flying like it's a shot one of your movies or something like that so the first thing i would do is i'd go to like youtube or something i would just look up drone flying footage and just time it out through YouTube. See, just see different drones flying and see how long they sort of take. I just time it out. I just like go to my uh, comet and period keys and just go one, two, three, four, see how long it takes for it to come up in the air, how long it hovers and you just count them out and then time them out. And if I'm animating somebody like doing an action, um, then I will shoot the, I will act it out myself or find some sort of footage or some sort of reference and I'll time it out and I'll say like, say it's somebody throwing a ball. It's like, well, from here to here is, is actually only four frames. So I'll just time it out that way. So I'm, I'm usually going off reference. The more you animate, one of the cool things that happens is you start to 
understand what four frames is. You can just see it in your head and you sort of figure out, you'll be looking at your animation and you'll be plotted out and you'll be like, well, I'm going to need at least 12 frames there to do that action. And then other actions you're like, oh, I bet I can do that on three, yeah, three frames because it's going to be super fast. And you'll get an idea, sort of an, um, an innate uh, feel. I think I was talking about this last time. Like, you know how when you see a, 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 you're driving somewhere and it says, you know, 12 kilometers, you know what, you don't know what 12 kilometers is exactly by measurement in your head. You just know how that feels when you're driving yeah, yeah. a car, what 12 kilometers feels. If you're on your bike and you see a sign that says 12 kilometers, you're like, that feels different. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're walking, it feels different again. So you know, you know it based on, it's a feel thing. It's based on, it's, it's less based on distance than it is based on time. And of course, if you're in a car with somebody you don't want to be with, then 12 kilometers feels different than being in a car with somebody that you love. You know, uh, what is that? Einstein's theory of relativity. It had, it had somebody explained it in a way of like, uh, um, is time is rel re relative based on whether or not you are like, what do you say? One minute when you're talking to somebody you love is way different than one minute sitting on a hot stove. <laughs> <laughs> two, com true. two completely different, uh, minutes there, uh, two completely different time, you know, when, anyway. Um, so it's, it's it that becomes, becomes like a motor skill, right? When you kind of, yeah, you sort of been doing it for a while, it, you sort of just get a, get to know. Yeah. 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 And one of the best things you can do is, is, um, when you're, especially at this point, when you're learning stuff is, is just play with it, smash your, your keys together and see like, what if I take eight frames up this whole thing and it goes zip, 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 zip. You're like, Oh, that's really fun. And then stretch it out. And you're like, Oh, that's really cool too. It feels heavier and just really experiment. I mean, that's what I do. That's what I still do. But that's what I did for years is, is I would animate something and, and I'd put it all together and I'd be like, okay, well, now what it's, I have six poses over, I don't know. Let's say I have six poses over 50 frames. Well, let's crush it all down to 12 frames just to see bam, 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 bam. it's sometimes it's hilarious. Sometimes it's just a disaster, <laughs> but I play with the timing and I've always played with the timing because I know that it's, it's important for me to get an understand, get an understanding of when I'm communicating with animators to be able to say like, Hey, just take six frames off that hold and it'll, it'll come together. Now, the other thing too is when you're working on a, on a production, you're told, when how long your shot's going to be you know at frame nine we want the character over here and make sure by frame 20 that they have the pen in their hand or whatever the hell they're doing right so you'll you will have cues that will more tightly guide you to where you want to be now for some animators that's that's a that's a curse and for other animators it's the only way that they'll work and and it doesn't matter which which is which i know some animators when you say like hey just do something cool with this shot they freeze up they're like i need direction and other animators, when you give them direction, they're like, uh, I kind of like to just to try some stuff. So it all sort of depends. What, what about you? What do you like? Do you like having those guidelines or do you just like to be free to do as you wish? <laughs> I would say both depending on the production. So um, yeah. I've, I've worked on productions where um, I've felt comfortable and I felt trusted and I, I, I knew the people I was working with and I had some great ideas and they were excited to see them. And then I've worked on other productions where um, it, it was a bit more intense. Uh, there was a lot of tension uh, in the production and there's been, and I've had directors come to me and say, hey man, um, we, really gotta, we really gotta amp this up I need you to, to come up with something that's really going to make this thing, you know, sail. And at that point I'm like, I don't I, I, I don't like this. You know what I mean? I, there's just all this pressure comes to be like, you really got to make something cool, man. Like we're counting on you. I'm like, Oh Christ. <laughs> I don't like that. Don't tell me that. I've just had 11 cups of coffee. So <laughs> I typically don't like, here's the thing. Sometimes I like that. If, if I really like have a good feel for what they're looking for, but if I have a director who's like, just hates everything and they come to me and go like, you got to knock this one out of the park. Like we're counting on you. And I'm like, what do you want? And they're like, just, just do your magic. I'm like, oh shit, really? Cause my magic right now is sleeping. 
So maybe that's what they do. So anyways, it sort of depends. It depends. It depends a lot. You know how it is, right? Like if you're comfortable with the people and you're excited about the project, then it's like, let me loose. But yep. if, if it's like suddenly somebody's throwing you into a role and now you have to, you go, go to battle with something you've never battled before and you don't feel equipped to do battle and nobody cares. Well, that's not fun. And here's the thing. Some people like that as well. And that's cool too. Some people like, you know, like bring it on, bring me the pressure. But, um, um, I know with graphic design or web design, it's, you know, if you don't really know what the client wants, it's, you, you don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it yeah. is good to have some, some guidelines, but at the same time, it's good not to have too many because you want to sort of have a bit of creativity. Yeah. And if I, um, even if like I've been in situations as well where I don't know what the client wants and, and, um, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable with, I'm like, I think I can, I think I know what you want. And even in, in, in situations like that, where it's really intense, it's like, it's okay. I, I got this. Cause I, I know my, I, I'm, I'm at least in my wheelhouse. I guess what I'm saying is if I'm not in my wheelhouse and we're trying to reinvent um, the wheel, too many wheels in that sentence. <laughs> um, and I just get thrown in and said like, we don't know what we're doing. We just got to make it look amazing and it has to happen by tomorrow and it's got to be like feature film and, and you know, a, a really great example is, is, is Tintin where we were doing, I was doing cameras for Peter Jackson and, and Steven Spielberg and I got thrown into the fire on that one where <laughs> they just plucked me out and said, Hey, um, Peter's looking for some really dynamic airplane shots just make them look cool. I'm like, okay. And I hadn't really animated a lot of airplane shots in my day. And I'm like, what's he looking for exactly? And, uh, um, my, my, um, the animation supervisor on Tintin said, uh, just make it look amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, and he goes, yeah, I told Peter, I got my number one guy on it. I'm like, Oh, don't come on <laughs> and i had just joined the team like a day before i had just joined the team i was in another department before that i come across town and i come into that and he's like we're counting on you i'm like fuck i don't even know like where the assets are you know what i mean it's just it's just like can you can i warm up a little bit first like for a month so that was super super stressful and there was just a lot of um there's just a lot of eyes on my work you know and so that, that kind of thing stressful. So again, it, it just depends. It really just depends on, um, on how comfortable you are. And that's always my goal. Whenever I, I, I join a new studio, like my first three or four days there is just winning people over. I, and by winning people over, I just mean um, uh, getting comfortable and letting everybody know that I, uh, uh, that I have the skill set for the job. And then that way I can do my best work. But I can't do my best work if I feel like, um, if I feel vulnerable, you know, if I feel like people are looking over my shoulder all the time or I haven't quite won, won everybody over. So it's always, whenever I get to a new studio, I always, uh, hello, can't talk dentist. Nice. <laughs> Sashford. Why your appointment should be at, um, two, two thirty. Two thirty. Um, so yeah. So, uh, when I, when I get in, I, I always make sure I communicate with, like I, I sit down with my uh, supervisor and just, just have some conversations with, with her or him. I, uh, uh, I sort of get a lay of the land. And then the first shot that I do, I just, I, I just get very specific. I don't get tight. I just get very specific. They say, uh, you know, like I, when I first started at Sony, uh, I came in and they said, uh, they did the same thing they did at Weta. They said, hey, um, we're looking for some cool shots for the opening montage for the movie and i go okay and they're like can you just come up with some ideas like dancing smurfs and things like this and when you look at when you get into in a situation like this you're working with a group of people that have been working together for a year year and a half so everybody's got their thing and you're kind of coming in and you're like hey how's it going and they're like ah it's a new guy and then when you get tasked with like hey do something cool so then everybody's watching like what's the new guy gonna do that's cool you can get real tight you know what i mean it can get real like ah, my head is getting squashed and you can get super, super tight. So in, in those situations, I just walk around and talk to people and I'm going, Hey, and, and uh, Hey, I'm Mark. And they're like, Hey Mark, I'm, I'm Sarah. And I'm like, Hey Sarah, 
um, uh, you from around here, whatever, you know, a little bit of small talk. And then you say like, <laughs> you, you, you know what they've done to me? And Sarah's like, what? I'm like, I haven't done a single goddamn shot here yet. And they hand me this stupid idea of like, I got to come up with some idea for the opening dance sequence. And she's like, oh, you one of those? I'm like, yeah. I'm just, elic- I'm just uh, eliciting sympathy at that point. And I'm like, did you have to do that? And, and Sarah's like, nah, but that's kind of, you know who you should talk to is go talk to Jeff because Jeff did it. And you're like, yeah, I know. I get, I'm just thinking of some stuff. And, and you start this conversation. Then you go say, hey, Jeff. And Jeff's like, hey, you know what I was thinking? And then you start to brainstorm. And then and at that point, like, you're creating a community or, of support around yourself. And, um, I, and this is just me. Listen, some animators can come in and go like, oh, yeah, I got this. And they like to work in a bubble and they'll go work in their bubble and they'll come out and they'll churn out something that's like, oh, God damn it. How, how are you so good at this? And, but, that's, but for me, I got to get comfortable first. And so um, happened to me once, day one, here's your scene, 10 startled horses. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, seriously, seriously, that happened. 10 startled horses. Yeah, 10 horses leaping up looking at each other and running off in different directions day one go (laughs) i want to even be able to do one horse (laughs) never mind 10 well here's the thing i i think it's really good to to remember um that like i always i always like to say uh uh to tell you know young animators that every doesn't matter how long i've been in this industry every time i get a new shot whether it's freelance or whether it's in a studio i'm always i always have this inherent fear like this is the one that's going to expose me as a fraud Every time. And, uh, um, syndrome. Yeah. Imposter imposter syndrome. syndrome. And the thing to remember is that everybody feels that way. Even the people who seem to be knocking out of the park, (laughs) you talk to them and they're like, Oh yeah, dude. And you, you know, I'll, I'll see an animator who like, man, that's amazing. And they did it super fast. And I'll go talk to that animator. Whenever I see somebody in, in the, in the studio, who's like really killing it, I'll go over and like, and I'll be like, Hey Matt, uh, dude, you're shot what did you do there? And, and, and usually the animator will go like, I got super lucky. You know what happened is I was doing this and then I splined it and then this happened and I'm like, Oh shit, that's even better. It's always a story like that. It's always like, I kind of, I kind of fell upwards. You know, everybody's kind of falling upwards. The animators who are like, well, I carefully blocked it out. And then I went step by step methodically. Those shots are kind of like, yeah, they work, but they're not like, Whoa, that shot's insane. And whenever you see a shot, like that's like, Oh my God, that's so entertaining. You go to talk to the animator and they're like, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of fell together. There's, it wasn't necessarily like really well planned out. And you just sort of realize like everybody's going through the same stuff. So for me to, to get, long story short, Sarah, do I like when, do I like a uh, really tight specific direction or, or do, I, do I like a looseness? It just, it all depends on, on where I'm at with yep. with my confidence and my job as an animator when i go to a studio is to is to come up with strategies to find that confidence and i can't blame people for it i can't go like oh my supervisor's a hard ass and i can't get i can't get on with her or with him and and it's not fair because uh my relationship there is is tough not my supervisor's problem that's my problem so my job as an animator is to come in and, and make inroads with the people who are on top of me so i feel comfortable with them so it, it frees me up and to recognize that that's that's a that's something that impedes my my creativity um i think i've seen that uh simon by Alyssa, elizabeth gilbert i think i've seen that talk and, and for some, for everybody, it's different. Everybody has their own kind of flavor of crazy, but I know for me to do my best work, I have to feel like everybody doesn't give a shit whether I do good work or bad work. So I got to get everybody kind of on my side and understand. And, and, you know, the first shot I knock out, everybody goes like, Hey man, that's great. And as soon as I get that, like I go into dailies and it's like, Oh, it's a new guy shot. And it comes up and people turn around and go, Hey man, that's really nice. I'm good. You know, it's, it's, it could be, it could be false praise or whatever, but it's like, okay. And I know when it, when it's good and when it's not, I know when I'm comfortable when it's not, I just need to get that first piece out there and say, uh, I'm not an imposter. And then the, now the next shot that I put up there, if it's not as good, at least everybody knows what I'm capable of and we can work on it. And there's not this like, I don't know, man, that's not so great. And I've never seen any good work out of you. So I just need to get that first, you know, I hit, got to hit that first one out of the park. Yeah so to speak. Okay. Uh, uh, Leon, is that cool with the drone? Are you, are we all good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. My pleasure. 
Um, Simon, it's a very small class today. I'm, I'm hoping it's not something I said. Um, I, I, again, I'm concerned that this class is going to be the one that exposes me as a fraud. <laughs> nah, you're, you're, <clears throat> you're all good. Um, I was quite, quite surprised, but yeah, look, they, um, sometimes they just get busy and, uh, I know that they, I feel like I'm talking with someone else's mouth here. It's, any, anything could come out. So if something weird comes out, it's not my fault. It's not my, yeah. mouth, my mouth. Um, yeah, look, I know a lot of them, uh, tune in at other times and they watch all the videos. So. Uh Oh, can you guys hear me till next week yep. so that you're not using them up? Yep. Cool. Uh, thanks for that. I didn't mean to make you talk. Uh, uh, uh. It's, <laughs> it's not what you say. It's how you say it. That matters. <laughs> um, Leon, did you have, I opened this, the posing up, but it doesn't look like there's any poses in here. Is that correct? Lectures, they're always fun and I always learn stuff, but I, I literally just pop in to see how everyone's going and just, you know, <laughs> just show that I care, take roles, that sort of stuff. So I might, I might dis disappear. We've got a, a delay going here, I think. There no, no, be. no. I'm just uploading the file quickly again. Oh, okay. Because I, I think, uh, yeah, because I uploaded the file, but I didn't save it. So, uh, yeah, it okay. didn't actually copy my version of it oh i see roger that there we go this is the one here yeah there's a, there's only one pose in there that's okay um is it a t like, pose no <laughs> i i like um overwrite the t pose t pose and i was like oh no i can't continue and then yeah i just didn't continue on like created more gotcha Gotcha. Good. This is nice. What I would, let's see. This is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how this foot's tilted a little bit. <laughs> Again, this would be a, a candidate for IK arms because we have weight on both of these hands, a little bit of weight. Um, I got a nice, yeah, nice tilt here. I'd take this, this hip controller. Let me pull it that way a little bit. Whenever we sit, we tend to roll our butts in there a little bit like that. So I would probably, instead of having the back arch that way, I'd probably lean them forward a little bit like this. But that all depends on your reference and what's happening in your reference. But having a little, I think having a, um, a line of action, excuse me, a line of action going this way rather than, than uh this way so you can see and again there's no hard and fast rules here this is just me kind of spitballing about um what makes compelling poses but you can see like this pose for example we come our line of action comes this way and then it goes this way and it's sort of broken up like that whereas if we rotate it forward like this and we and we curl the the hips up a little bit without breaking the leg there then you can see the line of action is is more like um it comes down here and sort of follows all the way through see it sort of flows like that so you get this overall c shape and it doesn't it doesn't get broken up like that so and the reason for that is it's just easier to um, uh, well, a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons is just whenever we're moving our characters, we're looking for uh, opportunities to show overlapping action. Now, I'm going to try to delete this frame here. It's probably going to crash Maya. It didn't. Yes. So we're looking for, for opportunities for overlapping action. So if we have a character who is, you know, like this, if this is his, the character's like body here, you know, bloop, I got some legs here. And they're down here and they're all sad. And then, then they stand up and go, hey, what? And now, now they're up here and they're no longer sad. I'm drawing with a mouse, so forgive my drawings. We're looking, we're looking from, to go from C-shape to C-shape because when we do that, we, we can get some overlap. And it just gives us opportunities to, to overlap our characters and to add um, 
more drag and follow through and all those, all those great animation fundamentals that make our work more compelling and, and more fun to watch, if that makes sense. So that's why that's kind of the philosophy behind when we're posing our characters behind getting these, these super simple C shapes, just because they're, they're easier to move through and, uh, um, uh, and they give us more opportunity for overlapping action. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So would you still have the C shape with the back, even if the character is looking up? Um, yeah, probably. I probably would actually, and I, I, I would, and it all depends on my on my. Rep so here's a, a couple things it depends on. It depends on where my character is going, and and by that I mean what poses I'm going to move into. So. Maybe I would do something like this. Let's say my character's looking up. So maybe I have a pose like, like this where he's, he's leaned back. And this hand is back here. Well, that, if that's the case, then, then I'm probably going to be starting with a pose that looks like this. Let's do this. I'll give you, a, I'll give you an idea what I'm talking about here. So if, if my, if my um, animation is eventually going to lead my character to be looking up. So let's say in this shot, let's say in this shot, I have a character who's looking down. Maybe let's just say for sake of argument, my character is kind of sad and and got bad news, and I, I want to do like a a bit of a change of 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 emotion with him. So he's sitting down like this, and he's all bummed out. At some point, I'll move this here to fourteen. At some point, he's gonna go. He's gonna look up. So I'm, I want to go from this C shape to this C shape. So that would be acceptable there. And now you can see like I have, um, if we just do it over eight frames, and I, I like to work over eight frames because eight frames is, well, I like to work on fours actually because fours I'm just, I'm just accustomed to. So that's what, that's what four frames looks like. Let me just go in here, make sure that everything's doing what I want it to do. Let's go to, there we go. There, that's what, that feels better. So just to sort of illustrate what I mean by, by going from C shape to, to C shape. If I go in the middle here, as my character's moving up like this, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna dip my weight down and instantly I'll get a, a nice little dip through there. And this is just in the middle between my two main poses. And now I can drag the head down a little bit and I can drag this forward a little bit. So as we start to lean back, we get a little overlapping action. You see that? That's good. It starts to drag forward and suddenly the whole thing starts to, and that's overlapping action right there. Try to ignore this leg doing its, its stupid thing, but that's <laughs> overlapping action right there, this thing. We come back and then we can offset this head. So now if I grab this whole thing here and, and uh, it's the whole character story, I'm going to copy this post to 25 and I'm just going to give it a little bit of a settle by deleting 16 and 25 are the exact same pose. So it's going to lock up. I don't want it to lock up. So I'm going to instead key 23, which favors my final pose on 25. Don't worry if you don't understand this bit. We're going to, this is part of the process that we're going to get into later on. So now I have a bit of a cushion. So now what I can do is I can take this head and I can overlap it even more. Like if I want him to seem like he's really surprised, then I can really drag it. And then his head can go like snap, snap, snap. And you can see how much it loosens up. And that's just, that's straight overlapping action right there. Drag is another, um, is another word we call it, but it's all based on overlapping action. And it's all just meant to keep, our characters alive and to have them flow and just to make sure that not everything's starting and stopping at the exact same time. So we get this nice flow to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So to answer your question, yeah, totally acceptable to have his back like this for a through animation, depending on what, what you're trying to do. The only, 
I mean, when I went here, I'm just like, I'm just looking as, as a single pose. I'm like, it, it all depends on, on what you're trying to do. But even now, if I was doing a single pose and this guy's looking up, I probably would still curl his back a bit just because of the single pose. It's, I just find it um, maybe more appealing than this one, but, or this one or whatever. But that's not necessarily, <laughs> that's not necessarily accurate. Cool? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. Um, let's take a look at, there's a couple other um, pieces here. I'm not sure whose is whose. Oh, we got a couple from Brittany. We have. Well, she need, she made a folder, so maybe she accidentally put them yeah. not in the folder. Oh, or yeah, there they are. Doubled up or something. They're just doubled up. Yep. Nice. Tea and tea and coffee. Tea and coffee. Tea and coffee. <laughs> uh, Brittany, if you're listening, um, send help. I'm I'm locked in this little box and I can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is good. So stretch. Uh, compression, all that stuff is good. This guy here is a little wacky. Let's bring him down a bit. I'm going to zero off. Oh, there is no rotations. Why does it feel all funky like that? We'll just pull him out that way a little bit. That looks good. I'd take this bottom, the pelvis here, and in rotation X, which is this one, I just pull that forward a little bit so we get a little more stretch and compression through there. Um, I like how you got the toe there. I might just to, oh, Sarah, you're going to bust me again. <laughs> I, I bring that leg up a little bit more just to, just to give it a little more uh, uh, break up here. Cool. And don't forget the clavicles. Oh, no, you didn't. You didn't forget the clavicles. You would never. Oh, look. Same, same. This damn auxiliary head. Oh, well. We got rotations on both of those. So what I would do is select this head, hide the auxiliary head. Before we hide it, I'm going to select it, zero it off. Select this one, like so, where it says Viz Aux Head Control. We are going to say, off you go. Off with it, Ed. Off with your aid. <laughs> Ed, this is the worst British accent in the world. Um, we should have a contest. We can do the worst British accent. I would win because um, Australian is closer to, to British than than sure. Canadian is. Joe tries to sound Australian and he sounds more British when he. Yeah. 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 I get. I got. I, I think I'm. I think I. I used to do that, but since I've been, I've traveled to New Zealand now. When I try to do British, it just sounds like a New Zealander accent, <laughs> a, a bad one. Not Same as your um, in, your Aussie accent sounds. Yeah. Like. <laughs> the only thing I can say in Aussie is "kark." Is what? <laughs> oh yeah, you want, you want to drink a kark? A coke. A coke. A coke. A coke. A coke. <laughs> how, how how do you normally pronounce it? Coke, Coke, Coke. <laughs> Pepsi. <laughs> we pronounce it. Uh, Canadians pronounce it like this. Oh, it's paused. Oh no, it's not. You just you're in suspended animation. Coke, <laughs> Coke. Coke. And I don't know what the hell you guys say, but I think it's sort of like this. <laughs> and we pronounce the fruit that grows on a vine. Great. Grapes. 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 Ay. Grapes. And you guys pronounce it like, uh, like you have a, Gripes. you have a no. problem, like you have a, you have a complaint. <laughs> Gripes. No, grapes. I used to work in a vineyard. What? How do you say it? A grape. Gripes. Grape. Grapes. <laughs> my uh, my daughter when we went to New Zealand, 
and we lived there and she went to school and they were going through the alphabet, you know, and they're like getting in the classes, you know, this is like fifth grade or no, not even that fourth grade maybe. And they're going through like, you know, say all the letters and stuff. And, uh, they get to, they start with a, what was it? Uh, Oh, the letter R and they're getting everybody to sound them out. And they got to R and my daughter is going like R and she said, everybody else in the classroom is going, ah, yeah. <laughs> and she couldn't figure out what letter they were on. They're like, ah, that's not an ah, that's an R. <laughs> R, R, like a pirate. I, at one point I, um, basically was a hermit and I only spoke to my neighbor who was Scottish my husband, who is American, and my other friend, who's Kiwi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I started to get a really strange accent. <laughs> oh, yeah. You start to sound like a, a Madonna. Oh, no. Oh, no. No. Nah, nah, mate. No, but she has kind of like this weird, like, American-British thing going on. It's, also, it's, it's a little odd. Uh, all right. Brittany uh, drone hey that looks cool huh all right i'll buy that we should have a drone pod race competition <laughs> a pod race a pod race rice life has got the shadows on and everything i know super fancy wow all right well it looks good to me um well that's it for feedback for this week uh but we still got some time do you guys have any questions or is there anything you'd like to see me go through or yeah i have a question yeah yeah go for it um it, i think it's like one of the um Zoom sessions you did like before this trimester started, you mentioned something about animating like from a single camera. Yeah. Um, what, what, what did you mean by that? Because um, I'm a bit curious. God. I think I know what, what was meant by okay. that. Yeah, you had the dinosaur scene. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I get you. Yeah, you yeah, tear yeah. Off, tear off a camera so you, and lock it so it's set. Yeah. So, you know, when we're looking at your poses, um, so if we just go back here, as we progress, we will soon start getting into posing to a camera. So imagine that you, you spent all this time posing this character and you're like, Hey, that looks really good. And you can go in here and, and I'll hit this little button here to turn on the lights. And we can see the silhouette and we go, yeah, that looks good. I know exactly, I can tell exactly what's happening. But, that, but then the director says, yeah, but the camera, if you look through the camera, it's like here. Well, now I don't know what the hell's going on. So <laughs> you always want to pose to a camera. So for example, um, if I have a shot like, well, for lack of a, Let's open up that, that. That'd be different for virtual reality though, wouldn't it? And games because yep. it's 3D. Yep. So if you're, if, you're, if you're animating for a game, and a lot of game animation is uh, motion capture. And that's one Does of the reasons. Does it have they... to be though? Because no. I would like to make mine all by hand with no motion capture. Yeah, it doesn't have to be motion capture. Is it just quicker with motion capture? Um, or yes, and what's yes, the, yes. What's the purpose of using motion capture compared to doing it by hand for games? So, the I guess the, the big difference is having done both. Uh, bear with me for a quick second here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't talk and think. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, I'll let you go. You're a male. <laughs> It is probably that. It's probably, it's probably my gender. Um, well, so, though you're Gemini, so you should be able to multitask. Yeah. You really? Yeah. The month, the month I'm born in dictates whether or not I can multitask? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's, that, that's totally something somebody who listens to Led Zeppelin would say. <laughs> Don't hit that one. Um, 
although I'm not multitasking very well and I'm not saying anything that's worth listening to either. Let's see, environment. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so the question, uh, motion capture versus hand, uh, um, keyframe animation. Yes, so um, motion capture is, for studios that do games, is way faster and cheaper because the the animation doesn't need to be stylized like it's not it's not talking hot dogs or or talking um not necessarily showing emotions for instance nah talking pandas or anything like that it's typically characters that are like you know um either sort of mythical characters but humanoid characters quite often in these mm -hmm. games and so they want the movement. They don't necessarily want the movement to be stylized. They want it to, to sort of mimic real life physics. So we have these motion capture studios. You hire a couple of actors, cheap actors that are out of work, which is almost every actor. And <laughs> you throw them in this suit and you pay them a couple bucks. And the directors, I've been on these, these shoots before. And then the director's in there and he's got the script. Have you ever worn a mocap suit? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's like wearing a, a, a onesie. They're not, uh, they're not flattering, at least not the way I'm built. Um, and then, you, you know, they're doing all their thing and you're capturing all this data. And by the end of the day, you have the entire scene done. And then you, you give it to a, a, a motion builder artist, one or two of them. They bring in the data. They bring the data in. They apply it to the characters. They do what's called a solve. And then at that point, you can hand it to an animator and everything's there there's just little bumps and stuff they got to clean up so yeah. that job of cleaning up um, motion capture is far less skilled than the job of actually animating yeah. something right because you're just going through the graph editor it's just everything's keyed on ones and you're going to the yeah, graph we editor. did come um with simon warwick in my first year of cg's back yeah. yeah 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 so you get it um yeah. but i prefer I think I prefer, it was a good, good experience, but I think I prefer doing it by hand. Well, you know, it, it kind of all depends where the work is, I guess, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's just, a, it's a different, it's a different job. It's just a completely, it's still in the animation, uh, under the animation umbrella, but yeah. it's a completely different job because you're, you're not blocking things out or anything, anything like Leon, are you familiar at all with motion capture data? Um, yeah, just a little bit. So it, it, it comes out, the entire character is all baked out on ones. So you can't really go in there and edit the graph editor or even edit the performance because it's just like everything's like you got somebody and it's got, it's, it's just got infinite detail. It has all the detail that the, that the actor had. So you can't really go in there uh, very often and, and, uh, uh, change the performance much. So it's just clean up. And so, um, and, and it's not there's nothing wrong with it, but just a lot of animators. It's not the work they want to do. I don't mind it. I don't care. The money. Spends Most of the animation same. I'll have in my, my game will be the animals, I guess. So yeah. I guess that all will have to be done by hand anyway. Yeah. Cause For I creatures, don't think yeah. I'll be able to get a kangaroo to wear motion catches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, no creatures are. So if you look at like a film, like for example, avatar or, Tintin is another good example. Everything in everyone in Tintin was motion captured except for like any creatures. So like in Tintin, he had this dog named Snowy. Well, Snowy was, was keyframed, was, was hand animated. Everything, all the other characters were, were motion captured. The same thing with Avatar. All the characters in Avatar were motion captured and the, yeah. the, the, the banshees that they were flying on and any weird animal like that was, um, uh, Keyframe to animate it, yeah. hand animate it. Now, getting back, Leon, to what you're asking. So, um, different different uh, um, sequences, we'll call this, call for different cameras. And so, getting back to the idea of like you always want to pose to a camera, with the exception, Sarah, like you said, with working in games, because games you're kind of looking all over the place. But typically, in a in, a, in any sort of storytelling film environment, yeah. you're posing to a camera. So when I if I go in here in perspective and I look, if I was to look at this whole thing, like from here, for example, well, I wouldn't have necessarily posed this out 
because you can't really see anything. So I wouldn't have necessarily posed it out like this because it's, it's flat. We're looking straight down the characters. It's all bunched up. It doesn't look as dynamic. So for here, I just did one camera, just a single camera to show all this action. And that's just a single camera. Now, what I could have done is I could have come across here, and as he's walking out, I could have cut at that point, and then I could cut to like a shot, another camera that kind of creeps over the top, so we could sort of do we could sort of do this, and do this sort of reveal as this dinosaur, you know, walks out. Now it'd be camera two, and then I could cut back to our camera where he's just finishing walking, and then instead, right now my camera pans up, but instead of panning up, I could cut to another camera that shows this tiger who's all messed up right now, but shows this tiger running and it could track with the tiger. And then, you know what I mean? So, and that would be a multi-camera shot. And in a studio, what would happen is, is if there was a sequence like that, it would be blocked out first, just what's called chess piecing your characters. So if we go in here and take a look at, uh, at the blocking of this. So the first thing that I do when I'm, blocking this stuff out is I decide how many cameras that I do I want and and that's typically dictated to you but in this case I'm sort of pre-visiting which stands for pre-visualization I'm sort of pre-visiting this idea so I get to decide the cameras and and um when you're pre-visiting for a for a movie like um uh, whatever um anything that Weta did you'd usually start with one camera because you're just trying to get your idea across to to Sir Peter um so you can see my characters, they're just kind of chess pieced across. They don't have a lot of, <clears throat> there's not a lot of animation data on them. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of like, uh, I'm timing it out. So I'm like, I move my camera, say my camera wants to go here, I get my character around here, my other character lands on them, bang, bang. There's no real animation, it's just timing the whole thing out. And that way, like, there's, at this, at this part, at, th at this point, there's, there's multiple moving parts. There's the speed of the camera. There's this guy coming into the camera view, trying to line all that stuff up so the camera feels nice and, and, um, and, and natural and flowing. So the reveal of our dinosaur feels good when he comes around. Of course, he doesn't. And, and then when we change the camera and look up, that it doesn't feel jarring. The last thing you want, um, well, probably the last thing you want is, is terminal, uh, terminal anything. But the last thing you want in animation is uh is you want you, you don't want you don't want somebody watching your your shot to go like hey dude cool camera move because then it's not a cool camera move it should be invisible right it should just be telling a story so the idea here is we we come around we see our our dinosaur walk out he sets up for just for a second then I just do a little pan up and the fact that when I pan up it leads us it it, it leads us to think that there's something that's going to appear here and then it does and then as soon as the tiger lands on him i just zoom in and the reason why i zoom in is because we do want to look closer we don't want all the action to happen out here we want to see it we and it's 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 really just the just the the visual language of like leaning in going what the hell's going on there that tiger just jumped on it so i, I don't want to whenever i'm 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 setting up cameras and i'm setting up my shots i want to only show what I need to show. So in this shot, I need to show a little bit of the environment and I need to show this dinosaur coming up from behind here. That's all I need to show. And I don't want to be too close to begin with because I don't want, I want to, I want to, I want to, in this single camera, I want everybody to sort of understand like, oh, we're, we're understand where our environment is. So I do have a bit of a reveal here where we're all tight, where I've got this foreground object. But then I, I, I come around, I reveal this larger kind of clearing in the in the in the rocks so to speak and then it's like oh look at that there's a dinosaur here great i don't want to be any further from back from the dinosaur because it'll make the dinosaur look inconsequential like if my camera was back here you know the audience might be looking around here thinking there's more that's going to happen um if my uh if my camera's too close then my audience isn't quite sure on where the hell they are so by keeping my camera right about there it gives me a I'm not distracted by thinking that something's going to happen over here, over here. It just keeps my eyes exactly where I want them to be until um, something else happens. And the audience is only going to sit here and watch this thing stand there for 
a very short period of time. So something better happen or else they're going to change the channel. So then my, <laughs> my camera yeah. goes, hey, look over here. And so everybody immediately looks up there. Even if that tiger wasn't there, that camera move would cause your eyes to look right there. It just would. You just would immediately look up and go, what's happening over there? So I could wait a, another second or two before this tiger ran out and you're, you'd still be looking there. So it comes over, draws your eyes to it. Hey, just what happens is a tiger there. Tiger lands on the back. Now, if that tiger landed on his back and they started fighting and the camera didn't push in, it would be a little annoying, you know, for the audience. It'd be like, what the hell's going on? So we push in and show them, this is what's going on. Check it out. This dinosaur is... That's a CG spectrum tiger, isn't it? It is, yep. yep. I and, like animating him. Yeah, he's fun. He's fun. Um, and so that's, that's what we do with a, with a, with a single camera. Now, multi-cameras just, just tell the story in a different way. And we will get into, um, we'll do, we will do a, a, a sequence of five cameras. And um, that's, it's, it's, we can tell the exact same story as this story. We just would tell it a different way with, with cameras. And it all depends on how you want to tell it. Um, with, with, um, when, when I was animating um, ideas for the, for the Hobbit, so part of my job on the Hobbit was just to help come up with some ideas because Peter wasn't sure what he, was, what he wanted to film day, from day to day. So he's kind of out of ideas, they said. And so uh, with Peter, you didn't ever do multi-cameras. You just shot it all on one camera and just said, this is my idea. And then if he wanted to break it up into a sequence, he could break it up into a sequence, but he didn't want to see you break it up into a sequence. I wasn't an editor. You know, I was an animator. <clears throat> so I'm just doing single shots like this. So this would be, a shot like this would be perfect for, I, don't, I shouldn't say perfect in that he would like it. He would probably hate it. But as far as construction goes, it's, it's exactly what he's looking for. It's like, hey, here's the story I'm telling. Um, tiger fights dinosaur, tiger loses. Yeah. That's it. That's my story. So, and I'm sticking yeah, guess- to it, damn it. I guess when like when we you... get to animate this in a while okay like with that shot i guess uh-huh. if you didn't zoom in um the audience would be like a little bit confused because they'll like still anticipate like something's going to come up like after the tiger while still like trying to focus on like the battle as well yeah if it just stayed out here exactly you'd think like there there must be something else that's going to happen there's just too much space around here. You know, I often see that when, uh, um, um, and I was the same way, but when, when people sort of new to cameras and new to, to blocking out shots um, start to work and they start to, to set up their, their cameras, I often find them. This one? I often find that they, that they, they they put too much information in their shots. And what I mean by that is that they keep their cameras too far out and they give too much headspace. So for example, if I had a shot like this where it's like, let's say I had a shot where um, we start with an establishing shot. So I could have a camera here where my character is approaching and let's say this tiger's not here. And you see this person here walking up so this would be called an establishing shot and then and then we cut to a camera where we're like close to the water and we see our character uh walk up and take a drink so what what i what i find it comes walking up and let's say just bends down and takes a drink what, or a poop, whatever he's doing. <laughs> what, I, what I find a lot of people will do is, and I don't know why this is, and I did the same thing. Yeah, a lot of people frame stuff like this. You know? Um, and if, you know, if he's standing up, they'll sort of frame him like this. You know what I mean? Like low in the scene. We always seem to put our characters low in, in frame. And so it's, it's just getting into the habit of like, you know, you don't ever want to um, uh, <coughs> cut cut your cut your uh, uh, character off or frame your character at the ankles 
because they look like they're standing in something and you also don't want to frame them mid knee because again it looks like they're standing in something so if you're going to frame your character um uh anywhere other than like mid thigh like that then either do that or or do show the entire character with with his feet so there's a couple rules of thumb but it's always like i'm always i always think like uh hold a this is a very american description that was told to me about screenwriting but it makes sense um with camera work as well is and you'll forgive me my americanism here but it's hold a gun to the head of your shot and make it tell you only what you need to know so by the time i get here to this shot i've already done my establishing shot back here so by the time i get here all i need to know is characters walking up character bends down to drink so my camera can like slowly truck in as well as he as he bends down to drink that's the all the information i don't need to know where he is anymore i've already sh shown that you know what i mean and then if i if i have my tiger back and and uh you know my camera can pull all the way back until we're like we see this in the foreground so you can get a nice sort of like composition like this as our guy's drinking suddenly this pops up and then we cut to you know a shot like this you know <laughs> he's looking across the way uh-huh human and then at that point we can cut back to this guy who's getting a drink and now we now we'll go into a tight shot of his face because he's looking at a tiger and we want to know what he's thinking he looks like he's been in colorado <laughs> yeah he's a little pale so at at this point we do a punch in be, uh, before we haven't really set up and got to know him yet other than we see him from a distance walking then we see him come up and start drinking and then we see this tiger and now we zoom in and we have him go like now we we start to get an idea of and this is just one way to sort of tell this story but now we can get an idea of uh oh, look at that <laughs> of who this person is is he afraid of this tiger or is he not afraid of this tiger you know, we'll get all that information now as, as we go. I'm not sure how to can he even it. see the tiger. <laughs> he can't even see the tiger. He doesn't even know it's there. <laughs> well, that's not going to be. Does that make sense? So there's all these different sort of languages and, and we'll get into that and we'll, uh, you know, um, we'll watch some film clips and we'll talk about them and we'll talk about why the director made the choices that the director made and, and so on and so forth as we start to, to knock this stuff out. It's very fun. It's very entertaining stuff. It's Sounds a whole, good, yeah. It's a whole world of storytelling out there for us. So um, one, one question. Yeah. With the multi-cameras, how do you cut from one camera to, to the next like, camera in like the next frame? Like how do you do that in Maya? Yeah, it's a good question. So <laughs> Maya has a has a tool called the camera sequencer, which we can use. I've never actually used it in production before. So I was a little bit hesitant about it because I've never used it before, but some people do. So you can use it and it will just set up multi multiple cameras. And then in the camera sequencer, you can flip between cameras. The way uh, I've done it at Weta is, is um, I just create cameras and then I play black, like create different cameras. So from one to like, 50 could be, you know, the establishing shot or whatever. And then 50 to whatever is my next camera, my next camera, my next camera. And then I play blast those cameras and cut them together in Premiere. Okay. Another way to do it, a really fast way to do it, is to use one camera and just animate it over a single frame. So, for example, I can do this. Uh, let's tear off. Here, actually, I'll do this. I'll start with this. And I'm going to say view create camera from view and then i'll go into panels and i'll see perspective one is my new camera i will uh go to perspective one good and then i'll say tear off copy there it is and now i'll go back to panels and i'll go to perspective so now i can move this around and this doesn't move so from here i'll go uh i'll select my camera i can Go in my channel box here and I'll just call it camera. Ta-da. And I will um, open up my attribute editor and 
again, you don't have to know any of this kind of stuff at this point. I'm going to increase my aspect ratio and we'll get into aspect ratios um, soon. And then I'm going to go down here to my display options and I'm going to turn on my film gate and just make it black and opaque. And that's what my screen looks like. That's what my camera looks like right there. Now, with my camera selected, I'll key it on frame one. I'll go to frame 50 and I'll just push it in a little bit. Oops, let's try that again. Go to frame 50 and I'll just push it in a little bit. And then on frame 51, I'm gonna cut. And I'll cut to this shot. So I'm just gonna cut over a single frame. So it sort of plays like this. If I hit play, I'm doing a slow push in, cut, he's gonna be walking. And so it's, I'm just, every time the camera changes, so it's just one camera. Now the problem with that is that once you put motion blur on that, every time the camera cuts, it's traveling really, really far over a single frame. Your first frame of your, of, of your next shot goes super, super fuzzy. So you can't really, use it like that for long, but you can start there and then you can attach other cameras to it and play those out. But probably what we'll end up doing is using the camera sequencer. We'll explore all these methods, but we'll probably end up using the camera sequencer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Hey, listen, I got another student popping in here in about 10 minutes. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm finished with you. Now I'm the user. <laughs> Do you guys have any last words? Um, I was going to ask about the camera. Yeah. Uh, pinning it to an object so you can like around a rash track. Or oh, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you that's can... just what I can, what you can do there is what I like to do is I'll select the camera and I'll group it twice by hitting control G two times. So now I have the, I have two groups. I don't want to animate the camera. In fact, I'm going to select this camera and I'm going to delete the animation on it. Now, let's grab this tiger. And let's drag this tiger all the way back here. Let's have this tiger run all the way over here. Zoom. <laughs> and let's go in here and just make that a linear curve. And now, back to the camera. I'm gonna go um, top group of the camera. I'm gonna call camera. Uh, second group is going to be called offset. That way I can move the camera around if I want to. Now I'm going to select, let's see, the top node here of this, what is this thing again? Tiger. And then I'm going to uh, control select the camera. I'm going to say constrain parent and I'm going to make sure maintain offset is clicked off. And I'm going to hit apply. And that camera is going to snap right there. But that's not exactly where I want it. I just wanted to get it, let's say, show camera so we can see it. No, oh, we should be able to see it. So that's where my camera is. But I don't want it to stay there quite yet. So I'm going to go back to constraint. And I'm going to say remove target. I just wanted my camera to be in that sort of neighborhood. Now, I'll go into my camera view. What? Uh-oh. Where's my camera? Oh dear. Oh dear. No, it's not a deer. Oh. It's a tiger. Let's try this again. I'm gonna take it out of that. Select my camera. I gotta zero all this stuff off first. A very important step <coughs> before I group it. Okay, there's my camera. Now if I group it twice, G, G, if I select my groups, good. So I'm gonna call this camera, uh, global we'll call it, I don't know why, I just have always done that. And we'll open it up, we'll call this offset. And I'll show you why we call it offset here in a second. Now, back, zoom back out, we are going to grab our tiger over here. Tiger, control select global, um, apply. Now if I look out, 
the camera. Good. I'm looking right up the thing's butt. <laughs> now I'm going to delete this constraint because I didn't want to keep a constraint there. And now I can, let's go back. I think I might have just screwed it up. Okay. I don't quite understand. Oh, I don't want to put any keys on the camera at all. So now I'm going to delete this constraint. I am going to go perspective camera and I'll tear this off, tear off copy so I can see through it. I'll go back to um, my perspective view. I'll grab my camera global and I'll position it where I want it. Ha. Hello. Tiger cam. Tiger cam. Now I'll select this thing again. I'll select my camera global and I'll constrain it once again. This time I'll say maintain offset because I don't want it to snap to its center. And now it will, wherever the tiger goes, the camera will follow. Whoa, look out. But that ends <laughs> up looking kind of stiff. So that's why we go to this offset and we can key that offset. And then as the tiger's running, we can take our camera off the tiger and like even look at it for a second. So we can go, we're running, woo, whoa. Yep. Thank you. So it'll still stay with the tiger. So it's pretty simple. Yeah. I'm going to have to rewatch it a few times to get it. But Oh, I should I should have been recording all this time. You are. I know. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I call it a bit of a fake out, a recording fake out. <laughs> all right, you two. Thank you so much for, you. Um, for uh, playing along. For those of you at home, you get the wonderful CG Spectrum home game. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, mark you bet let me know if you guys have any questions or you get stuck in a jam uh you know where to find me and uh have a great week and weekend thank you. you too yeah, thank you same you to you next week. All right. bye. bye okay bye